today on an all-new Dr. Phil. They were top of the charts in the 90s, but now it's show up to show wasted. Why do you think you're drinking to blackout? I'm an alcoholic. Color Me Bad's lead singer. He's pushed me, slapped me, hit me. Has hit bottom of the bottle. If you do try to stop him from drinking, he gets upset, he'll go into rage. You attacked your bandmate, Mark. He shoves me to the ground. He goes to TMZ and calls me a monster. So you're the victim in this. Today's gonna be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. You just might remember the legendary TV show Soul Train. Um, it was the stage that everyone wanted to perform on. Boys to Men, LL Cool J, Lil' Kim, all wanted to ride the Soul Train. Now, R&B group Color Me Bad was no different. They appeared on Soul Train to sing their hit song back in 1991, I Want to Sex You Up. They're responsible for one of the hottest records in America. The song on the giant label is entitled, I Want to Sex You Up, and they are Color Me Bad. Now, did you know, did you know that Soul Train was recorded right next door where my son Jay's show, The Doctors, is currently shot? Well, today, lead singer of Color Me Bad, Brian Abrams, and bandmate Mark Calderon are now returning, but not together, because one has a restraining order against the other. Why? Well, because Brian pushed Mark while on stage during a show just last summer. Here is footage taken from one fan during the show. with Brian push his bandmate in front of their fans. Well, since that time, Brian says he has tried to reach out to Mark but continues to get shut down. Now he says he is two months sober and wants to figure out how to fix his band, his family, and himself. Take a look. People know me as the lead singer of Color Me Bad. Come inside, take off your coat, I'll make you feel it. What most people don't know about me is that I'm an alcoholic. My musical career started way back in high school in Oklahoma City. I was in band. I was really pretty geeky, but I had pipes. I met Mark Calderon back in high school. We hit it off. We started performing at assemblies. We were always trying to be the center of attention. We were hungry. We wanted to be stars. During our senior year in high school, Cool and the Gang came to town. We went to the party. Cool and the Gang heard us sing. Next thing you know, we start recording this song, I Wanna Sex You Up. We released an album called CMB, and it had a string of hits on it. I Adore Me More. Sex You Up went number one R&B, and for us, because we sang R&B and hip-hop music, and because some of us were white in the group, that was a huge accomplishment. It was divine intervention. We were successful, and we wanted to stay successful. There was a lot of pressure. All of the artists and everything seemed to love the same things and have the same things in common because we all love to do this and we all love the fans. With alcohol, I found that it took away my inhibitions. It started out slow, a shot before going on stage. As the years progressed, I started drinking more and more to the point where I was binge drinking. I would start buying the pints, and so I'd buy a couple of pints of vodka and I'd drink them within 
an hour. There always comes that time when I have that little breakdown and I decide I can handle it. I'm grown. I want to have a couple drinks. And it just spirals out of control. I've been in and out of rehab four or five times. I've had three DUIs. I have shown up for shows drunk, walked off the stage, pushed Mark right in front of the crowd. I do things that I don't remember because as soon as I start drinking, I go straight to blackout. I'm afraid I'm gonna be one of the next entertainers that you hear about that they found in a hotel room. They drank themselves to death. I'm worried for my life. Well, Brian, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, sir. Hard to watch? Yeah. What's hard about it? All of it. Yeah? Yeah. So, why do you think you're drinking to blackout level? Well, for starters, because I'm an alcoholic. I know that, and I've accepted that. I drink to numb myself or to not feel hurt, not feel pain, not feel shame. So what's hurtful in your world? Um, the guilt from the things that I've done over the years. Um, things from childhood growing up. Uh, two hip replacements and almost 150 pounds heavier. I'm not happy with who I am, so if I'm insecure or scared to death before I go out on stage, feeling like nobody wants to see this big fat guy get up there and sing these songs, they don't want to see that guy, they want to see the other guy. Because I, I put together a list of the, the excuses, your word, uh, of why you do this. You said you're stressed and lonely. You said your career triggers you to drink, and you're just describing that, how you feel when yeah. you're on stage. You said the first time you drank, it was before a show, and people said it was your best show ever. Yeah. Uh, you said, I drink each day, so I didn't feel sick from the night before. So mm -hmm. at that point, you were drinking enough that you were actually withdrawing. Yeah. Uh, you said, I dated Kim, and we both drank. So something you did together, that was an activity you bonded with? Yeah. You, you said you were taking pain pills, and you'd drink less, but you'd get the same feeling from the pain pills. Mm -hmm. And you said, Kim, when she'd go with you, she'd keep you on track. Uh, because but, I wouldn't think to even drink. I wouldn't want to be right. in that place. And then if she didn't go with you on tour, then you didn't have that, she wasn't there to pump the brake for you. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't know is that I weighed 400 pounds the end of my sophomore year in high school. And I lost all that weight because I wanted to be an entertainer and because the guys in my band said, we'll never make it with you looking like this. Yeah. So I started losing the weight and getting it off. So in front of all these people and performing, they see this thin guy, probably one of the thinnest in the group, but inside I'm still that really fat guy with the skin hanging, mm -hmm. um, scared to death that somebody's gonna see the way I look or judge me because I'm not this new skinny guy in my head. I'm a really scared guy inside. Yeah. So there's a, another excuse for my drinking, but those were the reasons because I was scared to death to get on a stage and be in front of people, you know. So it started with drinking so that I could what I thought was be what I thought was cool, you know, in front of people. Were you ever insecure about your talent? Yeah, but not a lot. Not a lot. For the most part, I was, that was the only thing I felt I had in my life that I was secure about. You say if you were asked to take your shirt off in videos and that sort of thing, you were very insecure about that. Yeah, I'd say, do you want to sell records or do you want people to run? That's really, I mean, I was so that insecure. So body image was not good? No, not at all. All right. Now, I, I, was, I lived with Kim for two years before I ever even took my shirt off in front of this woman. Uh-huh. And... You two have had a volatile relationship to the point that it's gotten physical both ways. You with her, her with you. Yeah. Did you grow up around that? Yeah. And I said, I don't ever want to be that kind of man. And here I am. You know? What do you say to yourself about that now? Th that's one of the biggest reasons why I'm here. Um, career is secondary to my family, my wife and my daughters. Well, you know, statistics are very clear. Your 13-year-old daughter is most likely to go find you in this world and form a relationship with you prime. She's likely to go find the embodiment of you in every way.
to form a relationship with. That's why this has to stop now. Well, Brian's wife, Kim, says their marriage has been rocky at times due to his addictive behavior. We're going to add her to this conversation next. We'll be right back. Brian is haunted by his demons. He can be violent. Brian grabbed me by my arms and just threw me, airborne through the room. I literally felt Brian was going to kill me. Tomorrow, imagine you witnessed your father die, robbing a bank. Shot by a police sniper. Two sisters. You have not spoken to each other in five years. Struggle with their grief. I'm completely broken because of you. I am done. I miss my dad. I don't need this on top of it. Yes, her dad did something horrendous, but that doesn't mean destroy everybody around you. That's tomorrow. Then on Friday, she never leaves her house. My agoraphobia, it's crippling my life. What happens when you think about leaving your safe space? I'm terrified that I'm going to die. New Dr. Phil. That's Friday. Kim and I have been together for just about 15 years. Kimberly is my best friend. She's gone on the road with me to support me and be there. When I have her company, I don't think about drinking. If it wasn't for Kim today, I would probably be dead. I'd be in an insane asylum or living under a bridge. Well, we're talking today to the lead singer of Color Me Bad, uh, Brian Abrams, and his addictions with alcohol, pills, food, just being out of control, and a body image that leaves him feeling insecure. His wife, Kim, says their marriage has been a struggle, causing them to separate several times over the 15 years they've been together. My husband, Brian, is a musical genius, but there is definitely another side of him. He is haunted by his demons. When Brian drinks, he becomes another person. There's no such thing as a cocktail. It's binge drinking hardcore for days at a time. He can be violent. Brian's been physically violent with me at least a dozen times. He has pushed me, slapped me, hit me, pulled my hair. It scares the crap out of me. Sometimes I fight back and sometimes I don't. One time, Brian and I were in Hawaii for a Color Me Bad performance. He was supposed to go downstairs and get us breakfast, but instead went to the hotel bar and got wasted. When he came back to the room, my husband physically attacked me. Brian grabbed me by my arms and just threw me, airborne through the room. My legs scraped the corner of an end table and left a gash a couple inches wide on my calf. That was the scariest. I literally felt Brian was gonna kill me in that moment. I've left Brian three different times, but I've stayed by his side because I'm married to one Brian, but it's been hard for me to justify why I keep dealing with the other Brian. Well, Kim, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. You've been listening to what we've been talking about. It's been painful to listen to. Tell me why. Knowing that somebody who says that they love me could put their hands on me. <clears throat> it's hard. Yeah. I'm already starting to put some puzzle pieces together about what's wrong with him. What I'm having a hard time figuring out is what's wrong with you. Why is it okay with you for him to put his hands on you in anger and violence? It's absolutely not okay. Well, based on results, it is, because you've stayed in this. He goes right. down to get breakfast, comes back drunk, throws you across the room, gashes your leg open. He's attacked you a dozen times during this relationship. So you're either a slow learner or it is okay with you, one of the two. And I don't think you're a slow learner no. at all. So you're somehow making this okay. What are you saying to yourself that makes this okay? Um, it's mostly because he does this primarily when he's drinking. And because he's a binge drinker, he goes months at a time without drinking. And, you know, our lives are rebuilt. And I see him being the man that I know that he is. And I put faith in him that this isn't going to happen again. And I'm a Christian woman. I'm very forgiving. And I forgive him and think that it's going to be different this time. Because this time... 
he's not going to be on this medication that they put him on, or he's not going to, um, you know, do a show alone, or he's, you know, just making excuses for him, too. Okay, well, let's go back to the learning part then. Okay. <laughs> because you say this has happened a dozen times. Yes. So you, you, you have those good parts where, you know, he's being good, good father, good husband, and then crash. Right. But then good father, good husband, then crash. I mean, after a while, don't you begin to realize there's a cycle here? I do. When my girls were little, I pretty much made my mind up that I wasn't going to go through this anymore, and I left him. We were separated for about five and a half months, and, you know, I had everybody around him telling me that he was sober. He was telling me he was sober. We were still married, and my daughters missed their dad. What did you say when this happened, July 21st of 2018? He assaults Mark on stage during the show. Mm -hmm. um, the next day, he's arrested. Uh, what did you say about that? What did you say to him about that? I was angry, and I told him, you know, I'm always kind of his voice of reason, and I told him that, um, you know, People can say whatever they want, they can do whatever they want, right or wrong, but it doesn't entitle you to put your hands on somebody. Were you out of control that night? Yeah. So you were, was that blackout for you? I didn't remember any, she had to tell me what happened and she had to show it to me. I had no idea what I had done and I woke up in jail, came to, or, or sobered up in jail that night and I was scared to death because I didn't know what I had done. You know, you think that would be enough to get you to stop. And every, every bit of trouble I've ever been in has involved alcohol every single time. It's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You attacked your bandmate, Mark. He didn't even know he did it, right? Mm -hmm. He goes to TMZ and calls me a monster. So you're the victim in this. <laughs> Even though you attacked your bandmate, Mark, you actually have resentments towards him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said that he criticizes you and says that you hurt the band because of your weight. Yeah. Oh, and you resent that. Yeah. Is he right? Um, yeah, I guess he's probably right. I mean, I'm, just, I don't, I'm just asking. I, I, I don't know. I just, I think it's the way he goes about it. I've known him since childhood. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, man, you know, you need to lose some weight. We'd get a lot more shows if you'd lose weight. Brian's bulimic. You know, I know he doesn't like to talk about that, but he's bulimic. And it's basically, you know, been birthed by all this pressure that he's been under from the industry and his own band. And you resent that he discussed the incident on TMZ. He goes to TMZ and calls me a monster, and he, he goes to them to talk about the incident. And, I mean, I don't blame Mark for being angry and being hurt and being embarrassed because it's humiliating what I did to him, and I feel horrible for it. But I just feel like if you're trying to support our trademark and the brand, you don't go and bring more attention to something that, that doesn't need more attention brought to. Here's Mark's TMZ Live interview. Just take a look for yourself. Thank you all for coming. What caused him to go into that rage and target you? He was drunk. He must have said something to you since this happened, right? I mean, did no, he explain I himself? No I, haven't, no, I haven't talked to him. What happens to the group? I mean, here you got a one member assaulting you, another member wanting him prosecuted. How do you go on? For me, I'm gonna always do what I do. I love the fans, I love the music. I'm always gonna perform. For him, like I've told him before many, many times, go get help, Brian. So he needs to start with just getting help. This is the reason why that's hard for me to swallow because he says, when Kim is around or has said to me before, if you need support, man, I wanna be there to help you, call me. I don't care if it's two in the morning, we'll go have coffee. If you want a drink, then blah, blah, blah. You know, just, just let me know. And as soon as the show is over, and even sometimes before shows, I can't reach him until we get on a plane because he's out at the club. Like, I can call and I've left messages over and over. Hey, man, I was wanting to know if you wanted to get together. I'd like to talk to you or hang out. So I'm calling him for the support he's offering me 
but he's not calling me back. And, and it's not on him. He's so not my the babysitter. No, I'm not the victim. But I just think that he's also very hypocritical. Until the show, we're best buds. After the show, he disappears until the next day. Look, you choose the behavior, you choose the consequences. Yeah. Except with your wife, and apparently you don't choose the consequences because you There's take it upon yourself to stay with him after multiple attacks and continue to put your children in harm's way when you know you have a violent blackout drunk mm -hmm. in the home who could do the same thing to the children that he did to Mark. He doesn't drink at home. Um, you I got know an that, answer for everything, yeah. but you're still in the situation. <laughs> right. You guys are enabling each other in a really dysfunctional way here. I'm just telling you, you came because you want to know what I think. I'm telling you what I think. You're making excuses for him right and left, and that's not helping him at all. I'm open to that. Because he can get that. this under control, believe me. I know what to do here. He can get this under control, but you, you're not helping, and you deserve better than to live with a ticking time bomb. And, you know, I, I, I wrote a book called Relationship Rescue, and in it I said there are just a few deal breakers. One of them is violence. I agree. If you're getting attacked, the other is somebody that is abusing substances and does not deal with it. You got those two in spades, mm -hmm. and you're putting your children in harm's way because if you don't think he can do to them what he did there, he did not know he did that. He didn't even know he did it, right? Mm -hmm. He There's didn't know he did that. There. There's some backstory there. Okay, you're yeah. right. You're right. Of course. It's not his fault. This was his, all of his history. No, I didn't say it wasn't his okay, fault. Okay, so what does Brian's lifelong friend and bandmate from Color Me Bad, Mark, have to say about being pushed across the stage by Brian last summer? Well, I have to ask Brian to leave the stage due to the restraining order so I can hear what Mark has to say next. We'll be right back. For years, we've all tried to manage his drinking. Nothing works. Last year, he comes and blindsides me, shoves me to the ground. I was assaulted. I have a restraining order against him because I don't know what he's capable of doing. Mark's been with me from the very beginning. When they were on tour, Mark would go to his room, he'd check on him, make sure he was packed, ready for his flight. Mark's reply to any of this is, why don't you just stop drinking? It's not as simple as just a switch on or off. At this point, it seems like these days, Mark prefers to hang out and just live that nightlife. I could really use Mark's support, but I don't have it. If this color me bad thing is gonna survive, then Mark is gonna have to be a healthy support system for Brian on the road, or there isn't gonna be any more Color Me Bad, period. Well, last summer, the 90s R&B band Color Me Bad was performing at a show in New York when lead singer Brian Abrams, who was intoxicated, said he was blacked out, pushed his bandmate, Mark, across the stage. Now, Mark says he has not spoken to Brian since the assault and currently has an active restraining order against him. Take a look. I've known Brian ever since ninth grade. We're like brothers. It's been an amazing journey over the last 30 years. We've opened up for Bon Jovi, uh, Tony, 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 the OJs. We were a unit. We were a team. Grammy night, I remember that night, we trusted each other. We wrote songs together. He had my back, I had his. For years, we've all tried to manage his drinking. Nothing works. One time, uh, we were in Australia, and he walked into Vanilla Ice's dressing room and took his alcohol. It's just embarrassing because they'll catch him, and then they'll tell me about it. It's just a bad look for us. We were up for a residency gig in Las Vegas. After the incident happened, it was just completely gone, man. F up. Last year, he comes and blindsides me, shoves me to the ground. I get up, I'm looking around, and I look back, and I see Brian walking off, saying, I'm telling me bad. I was just in shock. I couldn't believe that somebody, you know, my brother would do that. I was assaulted, and his ass went to jail after that. I have a restraining order against him because I don't know what he's capable of doing. I think the reason why Kim has been upset with me is because I haven't forgave Brian for what he's done. And it was the text messages that came after, the emails, the threats. Now, I've always accepted his apologies. But, you know, enough is enough. I find the whole thing hypocritical. Mark will 
will say that he stands by Brian publicly, but then he will go to the media and bash him. I think Kim and Brian have this relationship where they're very codependent on each other, and I think Brian would be completely lost without her. Sometimes I don't understand why she puts up with it. I know one thing, I'm not going to put up with it. I'm done. Well, Mark says since he was pushed, they have barely spoken, but yet you continue to do shows? Yes. The two of you together? Yeah, contractually, we do fulfill our contracts, yeah. Okay, how do you do that with a restraining order in place? The first restraining order that we had, you know, we could work together. We could do business together. Okay, I got it. Yeah, and I then this other recent restraining order, that's where we had to shut everything off. Where are you in your relationship with Brian? Right now? Yeah. I haven't spoken to Brian. I don't... I haven't talked to Brian since last July. Um, I'm here to support him. I want him to seem to get help. You know, um, we've always had good relationships. I just seen him just go downhill recently. Him showing up to shows just wasted completely out of his mind. When I would check him into the hotels, I would talk to the hotel manager, don't serve this guy. You know, I would talk to the bartender at the bar, do not serve this guy, I'd show a picture. Um, somehow he gets through the cracks. I don't know. He's sneaky, man, and I can't control him, you know? And then if you do try to stop him from drinking, he gets upset, he'll go into rage, you know, start throwing things, you know? Um, it's just completely out of control. Well, it's that's like not your job, and it's not your job. Mm -hmm. The biggest obstacle I have in helping your husband is you. In what way specifically? Because I'm, I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to make those changes. Well, I, know I, you, just, I know you are, you know. but you can't make them if I don't tell you the right. truth. Yeah. I'm not trying to get you to be disloyal. In fact, I'm trying to get you to be loyal mm -hmm. to him. And loyalty means telling the truth. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I don't hide anything for him. You make excuses for him. Unknowingly, yeah, I guess I did. You, you make excuses for him. You try to trivialize or minimize what he does, you fail to acknowledge with clarity the gravity of the situation here. I Let have me... to disagree with that. All right, look, coming up, Brian has been listening backstage. I want to talk to him and see if we can turn this around. And, uh, of course, Mark's going to have to leave here. But let me be real clear about my position. He's not your job. He's your friend. And I, I have a real basic fundamental rule to follow. And that is do not reward bad behavior. A good friend does not reward bad behavior. And we'll get where we need to go. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man. We'll be right back. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil, their father was killed robbing a bag. I miss my dad. And I don't need this on top of it. Yes, her dad did something horrendous. That doesn't mean destroy everybody around you. That's tomorrow. What Brian needs to know is that I love him. This is why I'm on Dr. Phil, to support him. But he's got to get serious about this. I don't want to see him dead. You know, I can't have him in my life right now. I'll love him from a distance, but I don't want to have any kind of relationship with him right now. Until he gets himself together, I just hope that Dr. Phil can save his life. This, this could be it. Well, we've been talking with Color Me Bad lead band members Brian Abrams and Mark Calderon. Mark just left. The lifelong friends are currently planning for an upcoming show, yet they haven't spoken in seven months. Since Mark got a restraining order after Brian uh, pushed him across the stage during a show. Now, you've been listening. I'll let you comment before I start talking about what I think. Okay. First thing I want to say uh, is to clarify that since that episode, we have had more shows than we can count. Tons of shows. So it's not, this isn't the first show that we'll be doing since the episode. Good. We share dressing rooms together. We've been on planes and I've sat right behind them. We take the car from the airport and it's very awkward because we grew up together and he won't speak to me. I've tried and now I just leave it alone and I try to do what I'm supposed to do, which is be sober, be professional, do the show. It's hard to watch, but I have to be honest with myself and I have to own and I have to be honest with everybody out here. 
I wanted to come on here because, well, first of all, we're fans of the show. We've watched it for years. Um, I am here because I want to be sober. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better friend. And I'm, I'm, I sat there and watched, and it was, it was surreal. But at the same time, it was very real because I do see that she's making excuses for me, and I think it's because she loves me. Uh, but well, like you say, two out of three me. of us <laughs> see it. <laughs> I'm receptive to the it. The bigger boys not... see it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not um, trying to mother him. I'm not trying to make excuses for him. I just, my only thing is just that I want him to get the mental health help that he needs. You didn't say but. I didn't. <laughs> you didn't. I love that. <laughs> Give me some help. Okay. <laughs> okay. I've never been a rock star. And so, you You're know, a I've, rock star. I, well, I've got, well, I've got a, like David and the Jerk. <laughs> um, I, I do have a son that's a musician, and he's um, lives on the road a lot, and um, I, I know what that life is like, um, but. I also know that behind all of that, what looks glamorous is a lot of hard work and a lot of long days and, and nights. I, I want to talk to you about something I talk about from time to time called personal truth. We all have a personal truth. Everybody does. You do, you do, you do, I do, you do. And your personal truth is important because it is whatever it is that you, at the absolute uncensored core of your being, have come to believe about you. And personal truth is important because we generate the results in life that we believe we deserve. You don't take care of yourself physically. You don't require enough of yourself because you're generating results that you think you deserve. And unless you fix that, you're never going to fix all of this. Now, can Brian do that? Can he find a way to stay sober? And what's going to happen with Kim? She can't babysit him 24-7. She's got other stuff to do. Well, I'm going to tell him what I think does need to happen and why I think it needs to happen right now. definitely feel like I'm at a crossroads in my life. I'm 49 years old, man. My fear is if things don't change right now, Brian will be dead in five years. What I dreamt of doing, becoming a star and an entertainer, is what's killing me. There is so much temptation between drugs, alcohol, women. I've been told in the past that if my career is a trigger or creating the problems that it is creating, then maybe I need to find another career. Maybe I need to do something else, and there is nothing else for me to do. Growing up, there was a lot of chaos and violence. My father was shot and killed when I was two years old. Brian was bullied quite a bit growing up because of his weight and because of the fact that he didn't have a father. I feel like I've turned into that person that I swore that I was never going to be. The violent, selfish, alcoholic addict. Brian's past definitely still haunts him to this day. In fact, it is in control of his self-image, and it rules his life. We've been talking this hour with Color Me Bad lead singer Brian Abrams, who says he has struggled with a lifetime of food and alcohol addiction and occasional pain pill abuse. Brian's wife, Kim, says because of his addictions, her husband has been physically abusive, and um, she's allowed that to go on. I've taken issue with you about that, and I think you hear me yes. about that. Uh, if you look at the code, you can abuse a child by psychological, uh, physical, or neglect. 
And one of the sub-definitions of neglect is failing to keep the child out of harm's way. You're being negligent, which is abusive to the child, if you continue to subject them to instability or danger, which, frankly, you've been doing because of his erratic behavior. But we're going to change all that. Now, I said you need to do this now. And I want to tell you why. I want to show you something. Come with me for a minute. All right. This is a life ruler that I've created. Your, your father was shot and killed here when you were two. Yeah. And then you went through your childhood. You got bullied quite a bit. And then things went along, and you've had a very active life. And then come along here and stand on your age. There you go. I'm just almost there. Yeah. <laughs> look how much is behind you. Yeah. Now look how much is ahead of you. Yeah, not as much. Take it from me. Because when I go stand on my age, <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm about to fall off a cliff. <laughs> and you're not far behind me. Yeah. So, you, I mean, seriously, you've got children mm. to raise, you've got to, aisles to walk down with, you've got things to do. All of this is gone, and there's been so much wonderful that's happened in here, but now you've come to this point and you want to blow it all up by being an idiot? Yeah. Come on. You're better than that. You need to decide who you are and what you want to be in this life and this world. You're there, you've got a choice about how you want to live from that point going forward. He needs to never put his hands on you again in anger, not one time ever. Don't you allow it to happen again, don't you let the children see that happen again, and don't you do it again. Re decide right now, that's done. That's done. So where does Brian go next after years of addictive and out-of-control behavior? I'm going to tell him exactly what I think he needs to do when we come back. I, I asked somebody to join us here today, and it's my friend Brian Dunphy from Ocean Recovery. He is here to discuss ways to help you, and it's has to do with dual diagnosis approach. He does not deal with one thing. He deals with everything and has a multidisciplinary staff that's dedicated to doing just that. Brian, talk about this some. Sure. What we do at Ocean Recovery, which is located not far from here in, in Newport Beach, California, um, is we really work with people to look at the whole spectrum of behaviors that they engage in when the distress of old injuries that look very similar to current relationship uh, dilemmas and dynamics start uh, to, to come up for them. And we just try to create the narrowest paradigm for people so that you live in responsibility and relationship with other people, that uh, you live in responsibility to yourself with food, you know, um, that you really take a look at uh, what the development of the substance issues were and what they became over time, and, and that above all, you're responsible. I'm offering you this help. You want it? Yeah. You gotta be willing to lean you gotta be willing to lean into this and grab it with both hands. No okay. reluctance. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good with you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I want to thank all of my guests today, including Clinical Director Brian Dunphy and Ocean Recovery for taking the time to really think this through for Brian and his family. For more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks, and also have a new podcast, Analysis of Murder by Dr. Phil. 
That will keep you up at night. Um, <laughs> they're both free, and you can find them on the Apple Podcast app. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.